Bonjour à tous. Bienvenue à ce dernier jour de la LSE Week. Et on va commencer par euh, traitement de langage naturel et reconnaissance vocale à travers du machine learning par Xavier Cadet. Merci de votre attention. So, hi everyone. Uh, first, the presentation will be entirely in English. So I'm going to talk about natural language processing and speech recognition through machine learning. So uh, natural language processing, also known as NLP, uh, it's uh, automatic or semi-automatic processing of uh, what we call human language. So not like code, C++, JDA, like more what people say. Uh, it's multidisciplinary, like there are a lot of applications and it's kind of elevating to linguistics. So first, a uh, bit of history. So uh, the domain really began around 1950s and uh, in the 1954 there was a Georgetown experiment which was basically translating 60, uh, 60 sentences from Russian to English. Then in 1964, like between 1964 and 1966, there was the Eliza bot, which was a bot able to mimic a Rodgerian psychotherapist. So basically, you could have a conversation with it, but it would not really answer to your question. It was it would more like um, ask question about what you said. Like if you talk about a topic, it would just say, "And what do you think about it?" Instead of just giving its own uh, version of it. Then the idea around the 70s was to structure real-world data into understand, uh, computer understandable data. And lately, there have been a lot of attempts on unsupervised, supervised, and semi-supervised learning. Uh, so here is a list of some of the application linked to NLP. So spelling and grammar checking, as you can have on your phone or on text editors, uh, optical character recognition, uh, summarization, text segmentation, sentiment ana analysis on which I will come back a bit later, and uh, document clustering. Augmentative and alternative communication is more like oriented for people who have disabilities. Um, so there are a few difficulties on the domain and one of them would be the language dependency because uh, some language would not share the same rules and it might be a bit hard for a given model to adapt to other languages. Um, so one of the biggest uh, difficulty or easiest to explain would be like the similarities. So for example, in the next three sentences, how fast will my postcard be delivered? How fast does postcard reach? When can I expect my postcard to reach? Like the main idea is like the main, main message uh, from each of the, of the sentences is quite the same. But the information you need to, uh, the answer you need to provide uh, need to be different. And one of our difficulty would be links. So, for example, in the sentence, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie and her mother were talking. She and the next part of the sentence. The real problem here is, who does the she refers to? Is it Stephanie or her mother? So, for a human, when you have the next part of a sentence, it can be easy to deduce through the context. But for a computer, it's a bit harder to make it understand what does it refer to. And another example would be, do you sell any UK keyboards and mouses? So same here, the problem is like uh, the part with UK keyboards. So does it mean that the keyboard has to be sold in UK or that it should have a UK layout? And then for the mouses, like, does it mean that both the keyboards and mouses have to come from UK? Uh, so here is a list of a few concepts of natural language processing on which I will give some details right after, right after. So first, stemming. So it was first, the first proposed stemmer was uh, proposed by Julie Beth Lovins in 1968 with uh, development of a stemming algorithm. And basically the idea is to reduce inflected words uh, to their root form. So for example, if you have a word cats with an S and cat-like, it becomes cat. and Fishing and fish become fish. 
Um, something really close to it is lemmatization, which is basically going, uh, trying to get the lemma form of a word. And so it's really close to stemming, but actually the real difference is that uh, the lemmatization use the context. So for example, the word better would be turned into good through lemmatization, while it would, stay, it would st still be better uh, on stemming. Walking becomes walk with both stemming and lemmatization and meeting. The interesting part here is that uh, the word has two meanings. So let's say um, you want to meet someone and you say, are we meeting on Thursday? Then uh, the lemmatization would be able to tell you that it's the verb to meet that has been used. While if you say, uh, are we having a meeting on Wednesday, which is actually the conference, like a meeting, the noun itself, the lemmatization will be able to give you this information while the stemming would not be able to. So one other concept would be part of speech tagging, which is basically adding meta information on part of a speech. Uh, it's considered as word category disambiguation. So in English, at school, people learn that there are approximately 20 different categories but actually the, as the part of speech tools usually considered that there are between 50 and 150 categories, which are like nouns and adverbs, verbs. So for example, they make this difference between like singular uh, nouns and plural nouns. So here are two tools that can be used for it. So tree tiger and uh, NLTK. Another concept would be word segmentation. So the idea is quite simple. It's basically splitting a sentence into words. It might not be um, obvious for Latin-based languages. Like it might not seem useful for uh, Latin-based languages such as French, English, or Spanish, because we basically use spaces to separate our words. But uh, it's most likely to be used in languages that do not provide a clear separator, such as Mandarin, Cantonese, like Chinese-based languages, or or Japanese and Arabic. So. It, basically add space between words. And so some of the tools are uh, stand for word segmenter, which is used for Chinese language and Arabic, and Mikab and Kaiti are used for Japanese. So uh, a few words about word embedding, which is basically ma uh, mapping word or phrases to uh, vectors of real numbers. So it has some good result in sentiment analysis and uh, in biology and some like one of the tools we use was FastX, which is a library provided by Facebook. Uh, and one last concept would be bootstrap aggregating, also known as bagging. So the bootstrap method is quite simple. Let's say you have a vector of 100 uh, elements and you want to compute, like you could compute the mean of uh, the elements through, like you take the sum of the element and you divide it by the number of elements. So sum of x uh, on 100. And the idea is to generate like a given amount of subsamples with repetition. So if you took, for example, the, the first element x0 in the first subsample, you're still allowed to use it in the other subsamples. And then to compute the mean in this subsample and then use the average mean as the mean of your data. So, and bagging is basically the same, but with machine, uh, machine learning algorithms results. So a few words about deep learning. <coughs> so there have been good results like with both machine learning and deep learning in the past year on NLP tasks. So here are two publications, most, uh, mostly linked to speech recognition, but I will come to this later. So there are, they have been using like conventional neural networks and uh, deep LSTM, which is long short-term memory, uh, another neural network architecture. And uh, I would like to talk quickly about the DEFT 2018, uh, which is a competition to which we took part with other members of the lab. And uh, there were two main tasks. So we were provided with a set of uh, tweets. And uh, there were two main tasks. So one was basically determining the tweets was talking about transport or not. And the other one was mostly linked to sentiment analysis. So we had to uh, determine if a sentence was positive, negative, a mix between positive and negative, or neutral. 
So here is quite short the pipeline we used. So first, uh, there was a pre-processing part on which we applied uh, nematization, normalization, and uh, work to vec. Uh, normalization is basically getting rid of some information that we did not consider to be uh, useful uh, in order to determine the, the sentiment. And for work to vec, it's like some word embedding. And I will let my teammates talk a bit more later about this. Uh, for the models, we mostly use LSTM, the LSTM. The idea is that uh, the LSTM keeps track of information he has already seen, so you don't want to miss information at the beginning of a sentence while you are still processing it. And the BLSTM is basically two LSTM running uh, simultaneously, one from the beginning to the end of a sentence and the other one from the end to the beginning. And then convolutional neural network and GRU. So we wanted to, for the result we provided, we used some kind of fusion. We could have used logistic regression at this moment, but uh, we decided to go for a mean fusion. Basically, it was some kind of majority votes uh, on the, like we run the examples on uh, different models. And according to which, um, which class was most represented in the models, we decided to take this one, basically. Uh, one of the possibilities would have been to apply transfer learning. So basically taking a model that has been already trained on uh, ne negative, neutral, and positive tweets, or just sentences, and to develop it a bit like, like use this model and uh, stick some new layers on it to allow it to determine like the mix between positive and negative. Because actually one of the biggest trouble we had uh, was that our model were quite efficient on determining that tweet was negative or positive and neutral, and but we had actually troubles with a uh, mix between positive and negative as our model will basically say that it's either positive or negative. So one of the ideas would have been to use uh, label-specific models. So basically a model that would uh, determine if it was positive or neutral, another one which would determine if it was negative or neutral, and given these two information would have been able to say if it was a mix between positive and negative. So that's it for the uh, NLP part. So I will move on to speech recognition. So speech recognition is a interdisciplinary field of uh, computational linguistics. It's also known as ASR, so automatic uh, speech recognition or STT, so speech to text. Uh, the idea is basically that you have an audio record of someone speaking and someone talking, and you want to turn it into text. So, so there are a lot of different, different research fields involved in it, so linguistics, uh, computer science, and electrical engineering, as you have first the, like you talk into a microphone and then you have to turn the information you gathered into like data that you can use for your uh, algorithm later. So there are two types, like speaker dependent and independent, to sum it quite fast, basically. Um, like speaker dependent, like let's say you have someone, like you have a set of words in the vocabulary, and the idea is that you have to have a really precise pronunciation to have a, great, uh, a good model. And if you only have one speaker uh, tell, uh, pronouncing each word, then it might be hard for your model to be able like to understand a word if it's pronounced by someone else. So a bit of a story again. So in 1952, there was a Bell Labs uh, who uh, designed a single speaker digit recognition. So someone recorded his voice for digit recognition and um, it was able to detect which uh, digit was pronounced. Then in 1960s, there were Gunnar fans who proposed a source filter model for speech production. And in the late 1960s, there was the DTW, so dynamic time warping algorithm. We, and the team that published this uh, proposed a recognizer operating on a 200 words vocabulary. So then in 1971, the DARPA funded five years of research in speech recognition. And in 1976, there was the first ICASP. So International Conference on Acoustics, uh, Speech, and Signal Processing. Uh, one fun fact about both domains is that they, like more and more people started to come back on this domain lately. 
as the uh, as the computational uh, like as the power of computers started to increase, like was better than before. I had the opportunity to so I read a really old book talking about a uh, speech recognition system, and basically they were saying that one of the hardest things they had to tackle was this, the gigantic amount of data they had to store. It. So for example, to store the vocabulary and the way to process it, they would require at least a few hundred megabytes at this point, and it was a nightmare for them because it was way too heavy. And I had the opportunity to talk with someone who was working on um, on biomedical um, biomedical image processing, and basically his data set uh, is approximately 24 terabytes. So there is a small gap between the two the two period. So yeah, in 90, 1980s, that was the introduction of the engrams and the use of neural networks. So um, here are a few applications. So in car system, as you may have already seen, like when you get into a car and you're able to talk to it, like or to say that you're, you want to give a call or uh, to give a, a GPS location. Then there are application in healthcare, military, for uh, or advanced aircraft or uh, education, like mostly for translation or foreign language learning. Um, in daily life for house automation and uh, robotics for like a better understanding of human beings by robots basically and automated translation. So a few examples, like a few example would be Amazon's Alexa and Echo Dot, uh, Google Assistant and um, Apple Siri. So basically all of them kind of perform search and uh, are able to schedule appointment, notification, and stuff like this, answer questions from the users. And recently, like in 2018, Google published uh, a demonstration of uh, their Google Assistant being able to mimic a real human being and to take, uh, to, take um, to schedule an appointment uh, for air dressing salon. So, one of the most famous application would be automatic translation. So let's say you are at a, com at a conference or doing tourism, you would like to be able to talk to other people even if you don't share the same language. And if it's paired with um, automatic transcription, which is like basically speech, uh, speech recognition, um, you would be able to have the transcript with all the different languages that are being used in the conference. And so, for the state of the art, I skipped some of them, but uh, like the ones to remember would be sequence to sequence, on which I will come later. Uh, Eden Markov model, Gaussian mixture model, and BLSTM, LSTM. So sequence to sequence. So it was first published in uh, 2014. It's basically an encoder and uh, decoder. The idea is that you give a sequence in inputs and it outputs another sequence. Um, so basically for translation, like the example that was proposed at this moment was uh, like on the first publication was uh, to, to translate an English sentence into a French sentence. And the written arc of models. So the first publication was in 1986 and there are like a few other publications that are using it right now because it's, it, uh, it's in the center of uh, the speech recognition system, and so I'll give a short introduction to what is a uh, hidden Markov model. So here are uh, here's a Markov chain. So basically, it's a method to uh, to model random processes, and there are basically states and transition. So that would be a transition graph for like uh, with three state three states: so sleep, run, eat. And uh, on the left is the transition matrix, which represent like each transition from one state to the other one, and uh, like basically it model like the random process that can happen. Uh, there is also a interesting property on Markov chain, so what we call the Markov property. So basically, if I'm at uh, <coughs> if I want to know the probability of being at uh, the state sleep, I only need 
uh, like the only really interesting information would be the step I'm right be I'm right before. So if I was like it really depends on if I was on eat or run, but I don't need to know if I did sleep, eat, run, or sleep, run, r sleep. Like doesn't matter. Just the previous step matters. And here come the hidden Markov models. So the idea here is that uh, instead of having a specific, uh, like the state can have different observations, which are also uh, represented with uh, probabilities. So, like, uh, and <coughs> so, for example, uh, when you reach the state restaurant, you don't know if it was waiting. Like, you you could either go to waiting or eat, and the idea is that you have on one side a sequence of uh, st like you have the sequence of states and the sequence of observation, and like most of the problems are linked to determining how did you obtain this um, this observation. So here is the first problem. So the evaluation problem, which is the probability that uh, that a sequence of observation was generated by this uh, hidden model, but by the model you you had, and there are a few methods to do it. So the direct computation. Uh, this one actually have a few problems. It's extremely slow and time consuming. But uh, there is a forward method. I invite you to dig a bit further on it. And uh, it greatly increases the, the performances. Another problem would be to, like the decoding problem is uh, basically to retrieve the, um, the sequence of states that were taken to obtain uh, the given information, the given observation that you had. And one of the algorithms is the VDRB algorithm. And the last one would be like to optimize the model. Like let's say you have either a sequence of observation or a set of, of sequences of observation. And you want to like modify, like optimize your, the model. So if the hidden Markov model and there is the Palm Wells algorithm which allows to update like the different uh, data. So let's get back to speech recognition. And um, so one of the matrix that, uh, that is used for speech recognition systems is basically the word error rate. So uh, they distinguish three different errors. So insertion, deletion, and substitutions. So on the left side, you have the references, like the sentence that was supposed to be detected. On the middle, you have the hypothesis, and on the right, like the different errors. So for example, in the sentence, however, the cat ate a fish, like the hypothesis was oh, never. So however, it became ho, which is considered as a substitution, and the never was an inter insertion, as it was never here in the re reference sentence. And the A uh, at the end is uh, missing, so it's a deletion. So basically, to, cal uh, to compute the word error rate, uh, it's the sum of the uh, of number of substitution and number of insertion and deletion on the number of words on the reference sentence. Uh, so one of the key notions would be phonemes. So it's considered as the smallest unit on uh, in which you can uh, uh, the smallest unit you have in a s sound system, basically. So it's below like syllable. Uh, there are approximately 44 in English, and it's like, oh, you would split fun into different phonemes. I won't pronounce it because it's a bit awkward. Uh, and here are the different parts that are making um, a speech recognition system. So first you have a signal processing. As I said, like let's say you're recording, like you're talking to microphone, then you have a different wavelength, and like the like with the part that requires uh, a few elec electrical engineering knowledge, and then you have acoustic modeling, language modeling, and speech decoding. So, acoustic modeling is the part where the hidden Markov models are used. So basically. Basically, it's turning the acoustic waveform into a signal that you can use later, like uh, into like individual sounds or uh, phones. And so, for example, CAP will be divided into like the three, uh, these three cells, 
and each cell is divided into three uh, states. So the beginning, the middle, and the end of, uh, of the phonon. Uh, so the language modeling uh, basically determine which, uh, which hypotheses are the more likely to happen. So basically you have a, you have a vocabulary and uh, like there, uh, there are sequences of words that actually make sense. So they're more likely to exist. So if I say uh, today the sky is blue, like the sentence is more likely to happen than the uh, blue today sky is and so on. So uh, it has a limited uh, set of words. So it also means that you have, you have to be really careful when you choose your vocabulary as like, it really matters for the for the speech decoding because you can't just skip words. So one of the good methods would be to check the frequency or uh, utterance of words and use the most used one as uh, your dictionary, like the vocabulary. And last uh, would be speech decoding. So basically, like as I said, you have acoustic modeling, which is the sequence of acoustic acoustic la labels, and then you have the language modeling, which is the word sequences. <coughs> so the speech decoding, like, basically, uh, can be, like, is a decoding graph, and it associates valid acoustic sequences to valid word sequences. And uh, before ending, I would like to talk a bit about the problems and risks uh, linked to this domain. So. The problems are like all the ambiguities that you have uh, during each step of a process and uh, the fact that you can have a lot of noise in the data. Like when you're talking in your microphone, there could be a car running behind or, or yeah, a lot of random noises that are not uh, useful for the, like, like I don't think make it harder to determine what was the word that was said. And risks, uh, sorry. So for the risk, there is the privacy risk. But so it's not really have, uh, it's not no longer really linked to speech recognition, but I thought it was a interesting uh, aspect. So for example, for uh, Alexa's and um, Google Assistant, people started to notice that even if uh, the provider said that it would only activate on uh, keyword detection, so basically, uh, okay Google or uh, or Alexa, um, they were supposed to listen for these words in order to uh, start themselves. People noticed that they would receive um, advertisement linked to the topic they had with their friends the day before, which was a bit concerning. And uh, on security risks, so it might not be really obvious to understand on uh, speech recognition. So basically you can inject some data on the speech and like in a way uh, put some bias on the, on the information. So for speech recognition, it might not matter. So I would like to give two other examples. So the first one would be on the image classifier. So let's say you have a whole bunch of animals that you want to, to classify. And uh, someone like inject specific pixels on an image of a panda and uh, it turns into, like your model is no longer able to determine what is a panda and when you look at the picture for you, it's obviously a panda and uh, um, it says that, I don't know, it's a baboon or a fish. Uh, so here again, it's it doesn't look like a problem, but it becomes a problem when uh, it comes to uh, self-driving cars because there have been example of like people tweaking uh, signs on the roads and basically the, the car would not be able to determine that it was a stop sign or, and they are like, like it would think that it's a, a speed limit instead of a, a stop sign and that's a bit more concerning. It's also like, I think this example is better to explain what would be some of the secretaries. So, uh, that's it for the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free.
Yeah, so in the first part of the presentation, you explained the difference between stemming and limitization, right? Um, so I was wondering, do you have an example of task where it is better to use stemming than limitization? Um, so I don't really have an example. What I mostly re uh, uh, remembered from uh, the discussion about stemming and, norm uh, and limitization is that first one of them used the context, so the limitization. And usually people consider that stemming uh, makes you lose a lot of precision on the uh, when you use it as a preprocessing. But uh, I haven't seen an example like mostly using stemming. Okay. Um, also, you spoke about the, the n-grams in speech recognition. Yep. Can you explain what this is? Um, so, like, uh, to make it simple, like basically, let's say you have uh, a sentence. So instead of considering like one word at a time, you would like to consider like maybe two grams or three grams. So like the uh, two words linked to, next to each other, or three three words next to each other. So. Okay, thanks.